Welcome, church. We're so glad to be together with you today. Would you join us as we worship the Lord together? There is power in the name 
of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. sufficient sacrifice so freely given such a price but our salvation heaven's gate swing wide there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain break every chain break every chain there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Is 
love that is as strong as death, this jealousy demanding as the grave, and many waters cannot quench this
Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together as the body of Christ. Lord God, I was reminded this past week that it's awesome to reiterate that the church is not confined by a building. The church is the body of Christ. Ministries can still take place. You are still moving in and through and among us. And so, Lord, we are grateful and thankful for that. God, we are so thankful that our prayer life is not limited by anything, that, that, that it has no bounds. God, that we can come to you, that we can call to you, that we can pray in any moment, in every situation, wherever we are, Lord God, you meet us there. Father, I pray that through these moments of our life where we're unsure, where we're uncertain, where we have no clue where the money is going to come from, where we have no clue whether we'll have our job tomorrow, whether we have no clue what's going to happen. Lord, it's so good to rest in the fact that you are sovereign, that you are good and great and mighty. Father, I pray for your will to be done in and through our hearts and lives today. May we not be distracted or disconnected. May we focus on what you have for us, what you're going to speak to us and say to us today. May we learn your truth and may we apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, let me ask you, have you ever gone to an event or gone somewhere and you were totally unprepared for it? You know, I think about the moment where maybe there are times where we go somewhere like a ginormous theme park in flip-flops. Have you ever done that before? <laughs> I've done that. My heels are killing me afterwards. Uh, but maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you over-prepare. Maybe you've taken your recent trip and you overpack. Any of you overpack? Like you're going on a two-day, three-day trip and you pack for like a week and a half? <laughs> Maybe that's you. It's totally me. But if you're unsure about if you're like that, here's the way you can figure it out. After your next trip, what I want you to do is I want you to count the articles of clothing that you place into the dirty laundry bin and count how many items you put back into your dresser drawers, all right? And so here's my motto. If you put more back, you overpack. <laughs> it's pretty easy to remember. I, I should make a shirt out of that, right? If you put more back, you overpack. Being prepared for something is a little tricky, don't you think? It's not the same as planning. Listen, we plan for everything. We have day planners for that matter. We plan blind dates. We plan play dates. We plan lunch dates. We plan graduation parties ceremonies of some sort, like weddings. We plan for anniversaries. We do everything. Anything that you can think of, we plan for it. But preparing for something, well, that's a whole nother story. We can, can plan and plan and plan, but preparing for it is totally different. There's a variety of details that occur between the planning and the preparing that can cause or pose problems or difficult situations. The, the outdoor wedding that we had planned has now been moved indoors because of the most recent storm. Or the lunch date was canceled because one of our kids came home sick from school. See, we plan and plan and plan and plan until our hearts content, but we can't be too over prepared. 
Most of the time, the preparation is what catches us off guard. It's between the planning and the preparing that gets a little messy. You know, lately I've heard people say, nobody could have planned for this. No could have, nobody could have prepared for this. King Solomon, the wisest uh, king who ever lived, the wisest man who ever lived, he even knew in moments the importance of being prepared for battle, but most importantly, he understood the importance of knowing that, listen, God is, has been, and always will be in control, amen? Listen, I don't know where you are today with everything that's been going on, but please know that God is, has been, and will be always in control. God is sovereign. Nothing catches God by surprise. Do you know that today? Do you believe that in your life? Solomon writes in Proverbs 21, 30 through, 30, 30 through 31, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Isn't that good news? Amen. There's no wisdom, no plan, no insight that can succeed against the Lord. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. Wow. You know, today we're going to begin a new series and we'll carry this out into the next few weeks. And this passage, if you've grown up in church at least, this passage is really well known. Actually, I can give you a one word clue right now and you can probably get it in a second. Ready? Here's your clue. Armor. Yep, if you said the armor of God, you've guessed it. So in Ephesians 6, we find Paul's passage, famous passage on the armor of God. You know, isn't it good to be reminded? I I could tell you, I have heard sermon after sermon after sermon on the armor of God, but I, I feel like it's good to be reminded of God's truth, isn't it? I equate this with uh, marriage relationships. You know, we all know that our spouse loves us, but it's nice to be reminded through words and actions. It's, it's good to be reassured, and it brings confidence. And listen, it's the same thing with God and our relationship with God. We know that God loves us, right? We can call upon him, we can pray to him, we can come to him in any and every situation. We know that, right? I hope you know that today. You can. God's here for you. Even in those moments where he seems so far apart, he's the closest. It's amazing to think about. But listen, when when we know that and we understand that, it's good to know the promise, but to relive it is even better. So with that being said, please turn with me into your Bibles to Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Now, we could probably get by talking about the armor of God on one Sunday in this one sermon. We could probably do the whole kit and caboodle, but I want to focus on the description and the dis- distinctions of every piece of armor that Paul gives. And that's why we're going we're gonna to stretch this out for a couple weeks at least to talk about the description of armor. But remember, the key phrase that I want you to remember today is be prepared. Okay? Be prepared. Wait for it and watch for it. But for now, let's look at the first one. Verse 10. Look at verse 10. Be strong, be strong. The Bible says this, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You know, throughout the entire Bible, we see messages like this, these similar messages that have this profound freedom to them. In Genesis 4-7, God is talking to Cain and and he says that, uh, that they will That sin is crouching at your door, desiring, desiring to have you. And then he says this, but you must master it. After the crossing of the Red Sea, we see Moses and Miriam sing a duet. And they say this, the Lord is my strength and song. 
He has become my salvation. In Joshua 1.9, God tells Joshua to be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I have given them for their forefathers. And then he says, be strong and very courageous. And so after Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus, he's written all the way to the end, he gets to it and he says, finally, be strong in the Lord. This is how he ends this letter to them. Finally, be strong, he says, in the Lord. Now, as I was reading through this, I wondered, what does Paul mean by this? By this, finally, be strong. I mean, what's his tone? What is he trying to equip them with? And I, I think there's two different ways that, that Paul could have used this. First, he could have used it as an encouragement. Be strong, come on, be strong. You know, it's, it's kind of that, that, that idea that everyone wants to be encouraged, right? Everyone wants to be built up and approved, and appreciated, and loved, and valued. You know, I, I think of how in, in college I was on a track team, and we would all gather around as somebody would try their personal best in the weight room with, with the bench press, let's say, and, and everybody would get around, and, and as the person would bring it down to their chest, everybody would, would clap for them and go, come on, come on, finish, finish, and, and it would just give them enough oomph to get that final press and all the cheers would happen or I was a pole vaulter and what we would do is if there was a specific vaulter that was trying to to get a personal best or the meet record or they were finishing and trying a, a better height uh, what we would do is we would slow clap and it would get faster and faster and faster and faster just to get that vaulter enough gusto and give them enough encouragement to make the height and and I imagine this as an encouragement that Paul would use here. Finally, be strong. Be strong. Paul's talking about this in another verse. In Hebrews 12.1, uh, the author writes this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. I mean, do you hear that encouragement? Let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. That's a good word. Be strong. Finish the race. Second, he could have used it as a challenge. You know, as a dad, one thing I had to get used to was, was seeing my kids fall or hurt themselves and not overreact. <laughs> and if you know me, it's taking a little bit of time to get used to. You know, if, if, if I don't make it a big deal, though, I've realized this. If I don't make it a big deal, they won't see it as a big deal. Because my kids, and even you know, maybe from experience, my kids react over my reaction. So if I respond by saying something like this, I'll get up, you're good, you're good, the less tears and the more apt they're going to be to try again. Now, if you ask me, it, it, it can tend to seem harsh or insensitive but at times, but it's not intended to be that way. Toughen up, someone has said to you. Oh, suck it up, you're fine. <laughs> you've probably heard that once or twice before. Maybe you've said it. <laughs> oh, it's no big deal. Try it again. You know, all of these sayings are meant to challenge us for the better, to be better, to shape and mold us. It was the famous German philosopher Fred Friedrich Nietzsche that said, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. <laughs> What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. You know, uh, recently, well, a, a few years back after the bombing of the Boston Marathon, we started to see this phrase come out. It says, they said, Boston strong. And I've seen that used plenty more times after it, multiple times. And, and that, and that phrase is trying to provoke us, to try and challenge us to be better and, and do better. So, so Paul says, be strong. Be strong. 
But you want to know you want to know what the issue is here? This is what the problem is with humanity. We take that encouragement or challenge, if you will, be strong, and we try to do it in our own strength. I'm I'm guilty as charged. We try and do all that we possibly can to exhaust every opportunity or every situation to do it within our own strength and do it on our own. And then, <laughs> when we hit a wall, when our head is about to come over, wa- over the water, you know, uh, that's when we ask for help. That's when we run to God. You know, I kind of liken this to uh, those shows, those cooking shows that have those advantages that you can do. And, and I love those ones that you can call upon a professional chef. They're just waiting, you know, on the side, waiting for you to call upon them. It, it, it's like in those moments, those moments of desperation, those moments that they're just way overwhelmed or they can't figure out how to, to spice up a specific, you know, ingredient or anything like that. And what they do is that's when they call in the help from the professional chef. And it's kind of, it, it, it's, it's a lot like that with God. God, listen, God is waiting for us to call upon him. He is waiting. I mean, come on now, church. Let's stop relying on our own strength, being strong in our own strength, and call upon the name of the Lord. Yeah, but how do we do that, Pastor? Through Scripture, in prayer. Two passages that come to mind. Isaiah 40, 29 says this, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Do you feel weak today? Are you weary He gives strength. Who is that? Who's the he? Is it humanity? No. Is it the individual himself? No, it's God. God increases the power. God's the one who does it. I love the verse that comes right before Isaiah 40, 29. It says this, do you not know? Remember, that's kind of a rhetorical question. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. (laughs) Hallelujah! You know what the opposite of not growing tired or weary is? It's strength. It's Power. Listen, what humanity needs to do, especially in this moment, is we need to tap into the power of God. Not man, not ourselves. We need to tap into God's power. Wow, I, I love this. I love this quote. When we think about this for our church and, and for church in general, Jim Cimbala wrote this, if we desire the hand of God, for example, his power, to return to our churches, you ready for this? If we desire the hand of God, i.e. his power, to return to our churches, listen to what he says. He says, we should focus less on the personalities and abilities of people and more on Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Let's focus less on us and more on him, is what he's saying. To get his power back into our churches, back into our lives, back into our community and our nation and the world. Woo, I mean, come on now, church. Are, are you feeling Are you feeling this? In the midst of uncertainty, be strong. In the midst of suffering, be strong. And hey, listen, when everyone's going that way, go this way. When everyone is depending on their own strength, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Let's lean into Jesus more than ourselves. The second passage comes from Psalm 119, 28. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. I love what David does here. You know, in our culture, we have a way of sugarcoating things. You know, there, there's this raw and authentic emotion that David, that David expresses here. He says, my soul's weary, Lord. Have, have you been there lately? Maybe you're there right now. I'm tired. I'm stressed. I'm worn out. I'm exhausted. Can you relate to that? It's as if David throws up his hands and says, okay, I give up. I, I'm done with trying it my way. I'm, try, I'm done with trying it to do it all on my own. I'm going to rely on you, Lord. I'm going to rely on you. It's amazing what he says next. He says, because my soul is weary with Sorrow. He says, strengthen me according to your word. <laughs> Amen. Did you hear that? He, he, he doesn't say according to the latest poll or the latest research or what everybody else is doing or what everybody else is talking about. No, 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 no. He's, he's saying according to your word. According to the word of God. Listen, don't give up, people. Don't back down, all right? Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Whew. So first, be strong. Second, verse 11, put on, put on. It says this, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Let me give you a few scenarios. A hockey goalie without his mask. A bull rider without his chest protector. A construction worker without his hard hat. A rock climber without his harness. <laughs> a football player without his shoulder pads. A NASCAR driver without his fire suit. A scuba diver, a scuba diver without his oxygen tank. Yeah, uh, just side note, these are all really, really bad ideas. <laughs> and, and missing equipment that each person considers a necessity for every one of those scenarios. They would not be complete without any of these. I mean, to miss any of these things that I've just mentioned, it would put them in a vulnerable position. It would make it very risky and unsafe. And so as I read this verse, put on the full armor of God, the one word that comes to mind is vulnerability. Vulnerability. If, if by Paul's advice, we do not put on the full armor of God, we are in trouble. Listen, we are more vulnerable, more susceptible to what he says is the attacks or the devil's schemes. Now, don't miss this. I, I don't want you to miss this, okay? When we place the full armor of God on, it does not act as a repellent. When we put on the full armor of God, everyone, every single person is still going to come under the attack of the enemy. I think uh, my youngest niece, her name is uh, Michaela, and she's, she's getting used to me still, but I, I love what she does with me is, is she'll put her hands over her face. And for her, she's invisible. She's invisible and invincible and she is disappearing from my plane of sight and then when she obviously moves her hand she sees that I'm still there so to her I'm not there and she's not there but when she moves her hands I'm actually still 
there. You know, the same goes with the attacks of the enemy. We are not, please hear me, we are not invisible or invincible when we place the full armor of God on. We aren't. You see, when we put it on, it does not say that we become automatically immune. You know, as if we're Clark Kent coming out as Superman. That's not the case. No, no, no. Paul says, put it on so that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. You see, the devil's schemes are still going to come. He's still going to attack. But the main question here that Paul gives us is, are you prepared? Are you prepared? Do you have the full armor on? You know, it occurs pretty often around bedtime. I tell my kids, I'll race you upstairs, you know, because I always have to make everything a competition. (laughs) But it never fails. They always get a head start. I begin to count down, and they dart up the stairs real fast. And usually what I do is is, is I look at them, hey, hey, no, no, what are you doing? That's not fair. Hey, I wasn't ready. (laughs) Have you ever tried that before in a competition or something, sport? I, I wasn't ready. You know, I, I wasn't prepared. Uh, can we start over? Can we, can we try again? Newsflash. When the devil attacks, there are no do-overs. When the devil's schemes occur, please hear me now. When the devil's schemes occur, there are no whistleblowers. There's no timeouts or or wait a minutes or no head starts, no mercy. The Bible says in John 10, 10, that the thief, that's the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The devil wants to ruin you. He wants to destroy you. I mean, we're told in 1 Peter... That the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Listen, everyone is vulnerable. No one is untouchable. And that's why Paul says here, we we need to, we must put on the full armor of God. I mean, think about it. No warrior... No warrior would go out into battle without a piece of his armor. They wouldn't. It it, it just doesn't make sense. That that doesn't make any sense at all. That's, That's unheard of. So Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God. And of course, right now, we're, we're kind of left in suspense a little bit. But for now, we probably ask ourselves, you know, Lamech, how do we put it on? How do we put on the full armor of God? Well, the acting of putting on something is to be proactive rather than reactive, right? We are consciously making a decision to do something. You know, this is not the first time that Paul tells the, in the letter of Ephesians to the church of Ephesus, uh, talks about, he, this isn't the first time where he talks about a put on, put off kind of thing. He says in Ephesians 4, and 24, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I mean, f- listen, uh, this is pretty simple for Paul. It's like Mr. Miyagi when he told Daniel's son to wax on, wax off, right? But, but there is this domino effect that takes place, Paul says. We put off, move away, take away, we put off the old self, why? So that we can be made new in the attitude of our minds and put on the new self. Okay, so when we put off this, the old self, and put on the new self, according to Ephesians 4, 22 and 24, what's the benefit? What's the perk? 
It says here, because, listen to this, we were created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We were destined, we were created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. But now, listen, please hear me. It's not our own righteousness and holiness. No, 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 no. This comes, the true righteousness and holiness, comes from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul says, put on the full armor of God. Third, let's look at verse 12. Be prepared, be prepared. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Well, we've arrived. Hopefully, if you started this sermon from the beginning, you knew that we were looking for and trying to remember the be prepared part. And we've arrived at this. We need to be prepared. I mean, think about it. No one likes to be blindsided or caught off guard. I mean, it's, it's, it's painful. It's, it's hurtful. It's destructive. We always need to be prepared in mind and heart. And I love what, what King David does in Psalm 15. He writes about our actions, our attitude, and our awareness. And so what he does in this psalm is he begins by asking this question. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? Oh, I love that. Who, who? Who in the world could possibly live in your sanctuary, Lord? Basically, he's asking, who's worthy? Who is worthy? And he says here, he whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, that's our actions, right? Who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, that's our attitude. So we've seen our actions and our attitude. And then he says this, who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. There's the awareness. Our actions, our attitude, and our awareness. And then I love this. At the end of Psalm 15, David says this. He who does these things will never be shaken. <laughs> Isn't that good news? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! He, he who does these things will never be shaken. I mean, can you imagine just for one minute what an unshakable life would look like? <laughs> Whew. And listen, it, it's found, that unshakable life is found in God. We, we need to be prepared for anything and everything to endure and persevere to the glory of his name. You know, there's still another truth here that Paul talks about that I, I want to bring to light. Maybe, may, this may hurt a little bit, but I've known people to leave the church, a church, a church or the church or God altogether over a dissatisfaction with the leadership or a family or an individual. And by the way, I, I want to say this to, to put it into perspective for a moment. A pastor made this comment that has never been able to leave my mind. He said this, you don't stop eating at your favorite restaurant after one bad experience. Why do it with the church? And here's why. Ever since the creation, the beginning of creation, humanity has played the blame game. 
When God questioned Adam in Genesis 3 about the fall, Adam's, Adam's response was, the woman you put me here, or you put here with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree, and I ate it. <laughs> I mean, do you hear it? It's as if he's not just putting the blame on Eve. He's actually blaming God. He says, hey, the woman you put here with me, she's the one to blame. Then God asks the woman. She says, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. You see, Adam blames Eve and then Eve blames the serpent. It's all blame, 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 blame. It's the epitome of blame. So please hear me right now. Paul wants to remind us that our struggle, our circumstance, our frustrations, the things that come upon us, right, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against humanity. It's not against my annoying neighbor or my overprotective parent or the hurtful words from my spouse. No, our struggle is against the devil and his darkness. And yet, we're still caught up. We're still held captive. We are still blinded by our own unpreparedness. Quite frankly, we're, we're caught on our heels. A.W. Tozer wrote, In our churches, we often sing, Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears, but nothing happens and we keep our fears. Whew, man. You know, that nothing happens part happens because too often we're unprepared. We need to acknowledge, please listen, we need to acknowledge that the struggles and circumstances of life are not against anyone but the enemy of our soul. I pray that we will be prepared. Psalm 121, 1 and through 3a says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Lastly, stand strong. Verse 13. Look at verse 13. Stand strong. Therefore, he says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. You know, with all of this in mind, from, from Paul's finally be strong in the Lord to put on the full armor of God and reminding that, that uh, each of us, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but rather uh, it, it's not against what can be seen, but what can be unseen, what is unseen. He comes back to say, therefore, Basically, in light of all this, in light of all that I've said, put on the full armor of God. I mean, seriously, though, he couldn't say it enough. He says, hey, put on the armor. Put on the armor of God. Oh, by the way, put the full armor of God on. Not just a couple pieces, not this here and there. No, he says all of it. Put on all of it. You want the bad news? In this verse specifically, you want the bad news? Do you want the inevitable? Please listen. The day of evil is coming. Has come. Maybe you've experienced already. Paul, Paul does not use this day of evil phrase to talk to us about Armageddon what they talk about in Revelation, or this post-apocalyptic, the world is coming to an end situation. No, 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 Paul is talking about the day of evil as something that is common, 
that will occur continuously. Listen, whenever the devil attacks, whenever we are bombarded by the devil's schemes, that in itself, Paul says, is the day of evil. But don't get caught up. Listen, don't get caught up in that. I've been there myself. I understand. When those days of evil come, we start to doubt, we start to wonder, we start to get anxious. I'm being punished. I'm doing something wrong, or I've done something wrong, or everyone's out to get me, or I'm being, I'm just totally inadequate and unworthy. Nothing's going my way, right? But listen, Paul encourages and challenges us at the same time. When that day of evil comes, stand strong. Stand strong. Stand your ground. I remember the first time I took my kids into the ocean. I'm an ocean guy. Uh, My kids and my wife are, are pool people, but, you know, I love the ocean, and so the first time I took my kids into the ocean, I grabbed their hands, and uh, they, they hit the first wave, and the first wave knocked them back on, on their bottom, and they stood up and started to cry a little bit, and, and tried to, you know, spit out all the yucky salt water, and as they, they started towards the shore, I pulled them back in. I took them by the hand, and in, in, in every inch, in every moment and every step as they held my hand they got used to being bashed and bombarded by the waves (laughs) they actually now think it's fun but at the time it was difficult you know what was awesome about that is we can really make this an analogy of the father's hand the reason that they were confident with every step after the first one is because they were holding the hand of the father I want to ask you today, are you holding the grip of your Heavenly Father? Are you prepared? (laughs) Even when you're bombarded by everything life throws your way, never forget to be strong and put on the full armor of God. I mean, can we make a pact today, by the way? (laughs) Can we just all agree not to do life in our own strength, but rely on the strength of the Lord? I'll make that pact. I, I just pray that we will become a people that's strong in the Lord, that calls upon his name, that relies on him more than ourselves, that will be prepared and stand strong. I pray that God will receive all the glory and the honor and praise as we continue to stand in the strength he gives us. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing, Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it. Mount of thy unchanging love Here I raise my Ebenezer Hither by thy help I come And I hope by thy good measure Safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering far from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger 
interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. From to wander, Lord, I feel it. From to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it. Mount of thy unchanging love. I'm praying for you this week. I pray that you will be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and that through it he'll give you the strength to put on the full armor of God so that you can withstand the devil's schemes on that day of evil. And may he, may God be glorified and his kingdom be advanced. Amen. Go in that grace.